Well, thank you, thank you very much, Tonia. Thank you very much to the Ambrosetti uh, Forum for the, this invitation and to share this panel with uh, Professor Papa Constantino and with my good friend, uh, uh, Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni. Um, in this beautiful venue of, uh, of Villa d'Este. Well, uh, let me say something from the very beginning. You know, I went, uh, you know, thank you very much for the survey. Eh? <laughs> I, 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 I started to understand uh, how my granddaughters feel huh, when they are about to receive their marks. Huh? <laughs> but for the next time, <laughs> I would propose, in order to, to, to spread a little bit the scrutiny, that perhaps we should, uh, we should include other, you know, some questions uh, with respect to other European institutions. For instance, the Commission. Hmm? I suppose that Paolo agrees, so <laughs> agrees on that. <laughs> so having said that, <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much again. Good morning to everyone. I have to read some remarks, initial remarks afterwards. I will be totally available for, for, for your questions. But, uh, you know, given you know, that we have a very strict uh, code of conduct in, uh, in the ECB, my remarks will be published at nine, uh, so I have to read it. And afterwards, as I have said before, you know, I will have you know, freedom to, 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 to answer your questions. Financial stability is essential uh, to the ECB's primary objective of price stability. The events of the past few weeks have reminded us of the benefits of a strong and harmonized banking revolution, regulation and the importance of completing the banking union. We are closely monitoring developments in financial markets and financial institutions. The euro area banking sector is resilient with strong capital and liquidity positions that are well above the minimum requirements. And banks currently meet a very large portion of the liquidity requirements with the most liquid asset available, reserves held at the central banks. The situation, as you can imagine, is very different to 2008, 2009. Since then, harmonized European banking supervision has been set up and we have made good progress in implementing the global regulatory reform agenda that was launched in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. But there is no room for complacency. Recent events in financial markets have heightened uncertainty, which may hamper the transmission of our monetary policy across the euro area. And we are likely to see a further increase in banks, cost of funding, a tightening of credit standards, and a deceleration in the growth of lending volumes. There could also be a drop in consumer and investor confidence and lower overall aggregate demand. However, it, it is too early to draw conclusions about the impact of all, this, uh, of all this will have on growth and inflation. The turbulence may well be short-lived, but uh, if amplification effects do emerge, they will show up in the data. In this context of heightened uh, uncertainty, our approach to bring inflation down to our 2% medium term target will remain data dependent. As we clarified in our late, latest press conference, our future policy path will be determined by our assessment of the inflation outlook in light of the incoming data, the dynamics of underlying inflation and the strength of monetary policy transmission. We believe the headline inflation, that headline inflation is likely to decline considerably this year, while underlying inflation dynamics will remain strong. We came from double-digit monthly inflation in the euro area towards uh, the end of 2022. Inflation has been etching downwards, falling to 8.5% in February and 6.9% 6, 6 in March. And we expect it to continue to decline steadily thanks to lower energy prices, the easing of supply bottlenecks and the slight appreciation of the euro. In fact, energy inflation peaked in 2022 and should be around zero or even negative this year. But factors contributed to inflation are changing. Food and non-energy industrial goods inflation will, will likely only reach its peak in 2023, sustaining the pressure on core inflation with which edged up to 5.7% in March. We have to pay particular attention to factors that could pose upside risks to inflation. The first of these is rising wage growth, which has a significant impact on the price of services. There are no clear signs of a self-sustaining wage price spiral, but these risks need to be monitored. Labor markets, as you know, are tight, unemployment is very low, and people feel secure in their jobs, which is very positive. 
But compensation for high inflation is a main theme in wage negotiations, and nominal wages are expected to grow in 2023. According to our projections, uh, wage, wage growth is going to accelerate in 2023 to something above 5%. We are also closely monitoring underlying inflationary pressures stemming from profits. Profit margins have grown much more than labor costs in some economic sectors in 2022. The feedback between higher profit margins, higher wages, and higher prices could pose more lasting upside risks to inflation. Developments in China are another factor that merits uh, our attention. China's reopening is clearly positive for growth, but a stronger than expected rebound could boost foreign demand and add to commodity price pressures. We also need to pay attention to how fiscal support measures develop over time. Government's discretionary policy response to the high energy prices and inflation was close to 2% of GDP in 2022, and is anticipated to be very similar, a very similar level this year. Fiscal measures tend to reduce inflation in the short term, but we expect the opposite to be true as they start to be withdrawn in 2024, leading to higher inflation in 2024 and 2025. The discretionary fiscal support initially increases GDP growth and supports households' nominal disposable income. However, only a small share of the support is actually targeted at lower income households. As the energy crisis becomes less acute, it is very important that governments start rolling back fiscal measures. The increased burden on public finances, especially if the support is extended through more long-lasting measures, may pose additional challenges in Europe. Public debt ratios are higher than in the past, following the determined and effective fiscal policy response to the pandemic, and debt servicing costs are higher as well. Member States, member states should also take note of the European Commission's fiscal policy guidance for 2024 and you know, the proposal that uh, Paolo has indicated with respect to the modification of the fiscal rules. Turning to growth, we moved away from a baseline scenario with a technical recession at the turn of the year, as economic activity proved to be more resilient than expected at the end of 2022. In our March projections, the outlook for growth was revised up to an average of 1% in 2023. However, these projections were finalized before the events of the past few weeks, which are now adding uncertainty to our assessment. Nevertheless, reduced concerns about energy shortages and price increases, coupled with the continued resilience of the labor market, are expected to support activity over the coming quarters. In short, the growth outlook remains weak, but it has improved somewhat. At the Governing Council meeting in March, we decided to increase uh, the three key ECB interest rates by 50 basis points, in line with our determination to ensure the timely return of inflation to our 2% medium-term target. As part of the monetary policy normalization process, from the beginning of March, our asset purchase program portfolio has been declining at a pace of 15 billion euro per month, on average, and it will continue to decline at its pace until the end of June 2023, while its subsequent pace will be determined over time. Uncertainty has increased, so we are monitoring current market tensions closely and stand ready to respond as necessary to preserve price stability and financial stability in the euro area. But let me go back to financial stability. Just a few weeks ago, before tensions in financial markets emerged on both sides of the Atlantic, the overall improvement in the outlook for growth and inflation was supporting overly benign macrofinancial expectations on the part of banks and financial market participants. Despite rising funding costs, bank profitability has improved, driven, driven by significantly higher net interest income, while impairments and provisions have been muted so far. Overall, from a system-wide perspective, euro area banks are moderately exposed to interest rate risk. Most are actually positioned to initially benefit from increasing interest rates, which boost net interest, interest margins. On average, loan book repricing tends to more than offset higher funding costs and mark-to-market losses on fixed income securities portfolios. It is inevitable, however, that with the tightening of financing conditions and in line with our policy risk objective, lending dynamics are weakening and may weigh on bank profitability going forward. 
Of course, certain bank business models may be more vulnerable to this transition. But in our view, vulnerabilities in the financial system prevail in the non-bank financial sector, which grew fast and increased its risk-taking during the low interest rate environment. Credit and liquidity risk remain high, making the sector more vulnerable to market volatility and an abrupt repricing in financial markets. Despite some recent risking, a structural liquidity mismatch prevails in the non-bank financial sector, and market corrections could be amplified by forced selling into liquidity markets. It is critical that policy reforms are pursued to address these vulnerabilities. Priority should be given to policies that help build resilience in the sector, such as by reducing liquidity mismatch, mitigating risk from leverage, and enhancing liquidity preparedness across a broad range of institutions. Thank you very much.